Heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful day, Lord, with you, that we get together together to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, just uh, how exciting it is that you're, you care for us so much, that uh, your spirit is, just teaches us all these wonderful things we need to learn. And we just pray for this morning, Lord, as we worship you, that our hearts would be surrendered completely to you, that, Lord, as the things you share with us, we would take to heart and apply to our lives. Lord, we love you so much, and we want to honor you in all that we do, all that we say. Lord, just teach us so as we go out into this world, you would be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. This morning we'll read from Psalm 80. O give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. O God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with bread of tears and you have made them to drink tears of large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. O God of hosts, restore us and cause, the f cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. You removed a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground before it and it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why have you broken down its hedges so that all who pass that way pick up its fruit? A boar from the forest eats it away and whatever moves in the field feeds upon it. O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Even the shoot which your right hand has planted and on the sun whom you have strengthened for yourself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man on your right hand upon the Son of Man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. O Lord of hosts, restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 2. Um, some of you are thinking, wow, we actually made it to chapter 2. Yes, we did. Uh, <laughs> and uh, chapter 1 had a lot of information, and there's some great stuff here in chapter 2 that the Lord has for us. Uh, and again, the whole focus here is victorious Christian living. We want that for our lives. We don't want to fail, and we don't only want to start out well. We want to finish our race well as well. The problem is that we think, of this victorious Christian living in terms of you know self-help, self-improvement, that I can do this. And it's interesting, I, I kind of thought, you know, hey, how many web pages are out there for Christian self-help books, self-help information? And I got 468 million self-help books, it's 468 million. And granted, not everyone is promoting these books, but most of them are, and they're selling their books. And you think, man, if there's that many books, why are we in so much trouble, right? Because <laughs> they don't help, you know? We think we could do it on our, on our own. We could just have to try harder. We have to suck it up, whatever that means. I'm not even sure what that means. And we can accomplish anything. You know, there's a problem with that kind of thinking, and we've said this many times. It's not self-help. It's God help me, right? That's what we cry out. You know, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, not to the next self-help book. Lead me to God. And that's important. And yet, this is a multi-billion dollar industry, as you could see. And, it, and if it worked, it would be wonderful. It would be great, but it doesn't. This is an article I'm going to share with you. It's from Psychology Today. I don't really support their 
thinking, but boy, they nailed this. And this has to do with self-help. The article goes like this. Change, whether you call it self-help, personal transformation, growth, or just plain change, it is a goal to which virtually everyone aspires. Gaining self-esteem, losing weight, improving relationships, achieving success, getting rich, or finding happiness are just a few of the ways in which people the world over want to alter their lives. Our ability to achieve these goals depends on whether we can change the way we think, feel, and behave in ways that will encourage the pursuit of these goals. Without change, as the old Texas adage goes, if all you, do, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, then all you ever get is all you ever got. Wow, that's a Texas saying. Yet, is there anything that we devote more time, effort, and money to anything or than to attempting to achieve the elusive goal? And is there anything that we pursue with such vigor and yet with such poor results than the quest for change? And I'm sure we've all been there, trying to do this, do, you know, change our ways. We try to do it, and we fail. It goes on, thankfully, there are a lot of people out there more than willing to help you change, for a small price, of course. Did you know that self-help is a $10 billion a year industry? Wow. By the way, as the late and great comedian George Carlin riffs in one of his stand-up routines, I went to a bookstore and asked the saleswoman, where's the self-help section? She said if she told me, it would defeat the purpose. <laughs> uh, think about that. Yeah. What does the size of the self-help industry say about change? For, no one, for one, no one has found the secret or the answers, titles, I should note, of two best-selling personal transformation books. People are still looking for honest-to-goodness ways to change. And let's be really frank here. As George Carlin also observed, if you're reading it in a book, folks, it ain't self-help. It's help. But help is okay, too, as long as it actually helps. Unfortunately, change has gotten a bad rap because of the self-help industry. It has become a parody of itself and many of its leading proponents, such as Dr. Phil and Anthony Robbins have truly jumped the shark. Watching self-help gurus on TV is like watching Saturday Night Live skit of self-help gurus on TV. Numerous articles have been written about the disingenuousness and downright dishonesty of self-help gurus and their services and products. Just do a web search of self-help industry and see for yourself. We hear the outrageous promises of fast and easy change that simply affirm the well-knowing saying often attributed to P.T. Barnum, there's a sucker born every minute. We hear claims cloaked in scientific language. The law of attraction offered in the secret is, according to the author Rhonda Barnes, a natural law as real as gravity. We hear the sardonic commentary that the only people who are being helped are the gurus who are making millions off of gullible buyers of self-help books, CDs, and DVDs. He says people are willing to plunk down $23.95 for a book or $15.95 for a DVD that promises that its method is really no. I mean, really the one that will help them change. What's a few or what's a few bucks for the possibility, whatever the improbability of finding that pot of gold at the end of the I can change my life rainbow. And that's the thing, they, they dangle this stuff in front of us and go, well, it's $23, it's $15. If it works, it's worth it, right? And that's our mentality. And that's how they get us. Of course, when that book, CD, or DVD doesn't produce the desired change, another self-help product comes along that promises to do the trick. And as long as the price is right, people will continue to line the pockets of the self-help industry in perpetuity, in forever, I guess. To do otherwise would be to admit defeat and be labeled a loser in our aspirational, I can have everything I want without any effort culture. Such an admission would mean a lifelong sentence of not being successful, happy, rich, slim, or loved. And that is just plain unacceptable. You know, we, even as Christians, get, get caught up in the myriads of self-help books that are out there from, you know, being purpose-driven to the road back to you or whatever. But what about the Bible, guys? 
The Bible's not a self-help book. It's really God help me book. That's what it's about. Why don't we go to the God help me book? Because we don't like the answers. <laughs> oh, that person that's really mean to me. Forgive them. What? You see, we don't like those answers. But do you really believe that God knows what he's talking about? I hope so. That's really important. God wants us to have this victorious Christian life, but it, we have to surrender to him. Die to self, and it takes time. Angie sent me this video. This, I looked at it this morning. Why I do that stuff to myself, I don't know. It's a short one, she said. And it was, it was only five minutes. And it's by it's psychology and, you know, um, how narcissistic narcissistic moms have hurt us and all the things we need to do to get better and to you know show everyone the elephant in the room that this is a big problem and we need to deal with it even when everyone else in the family is ignoring it we got to bring this out there that we had a narcissistic mom and I'm thinking you are really narcissistic <laughs> right and here's the thing it's supposed to be a Christian thing she said something that it's about spirituality, which is not Christian, but she spoke it. And then she said something interesting. She said, stop being sheep and be giraffes and be able to look out and see everything. Who calls us sheep? Jesus does. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow who? This woman or the Lord? We follow Jesus. Has God indeed said, be very careful. Of all the creatures on this planet, she said, don't be sheep, be a giraffe. And there's a reason for it, because we're discrediting the word of God. Be very careful. This is a God help me book. This is how much God loves us. I'm a sinner separated from God. What do I do? God help me. And what does he do? He helps me. He shows me. And we'll talk about that a little this morning. And another issue for us is, you know, we have these problems and we don't want to wait for the answers. We don't want to wait for the resolution of the problem. We want it to get better now. We want it to fix now. We want the answers now. And it takes time. We need to be patient. Now, this morning in our study, it's kind of interesting because, you know, in, in reading this text, it's like, you're probably going to think, where'd you come up with this, Joe? And you'll see. This is kind of an interesting study because it's about rescuing people who have been taken captive by the devil through his lies. And we have the truth, and we can set them free. And we have to bring that truth to them. And again, you're going to, it's an interesting study this morning, as you'll see. You think, well, what truth sets them free? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's simple. The good news, it's come. God has come to rescue man from his sin by paying in full the penalty for man's sin. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And here in Joshua, like in our own lives today, it's all about rescuing people from the coming judgment. Now, before we get to our text, let me kind of set the stage for what's going on here in, in Joshua with the children of Israel, what they're getting ready to encounter. Remember, Moses, the servant of God, is dead. Joshua is now leading the children of Israel and is going to lead them into the promised land. A little anxious, a little nervous, a big responsibility. Joshua was a little afraid. And the Lord says, don't be afraid. Be strong in me. Be strong in the Lord. He's going to, the Lord is the one who's going to lead the children of Israel to really boldly go where they've never gone before into this promised land. And we saw last time in our study that Israel recognized Joshua as their leader. And they will follow Joshua wherever he goes. But there was one, one stipulation to following Joshua, and a very important one. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, or 16 through 18, we're told, So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us we will do. And wherever you send us we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. 
Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. In other words, they're telling Joshua, Joshua, man, we will follow you just like we follow Moses. We will follow you wherever you lead us as long as you're following the Lord. And that's so important. You don't want to follow a leader who's not following the Lord. That's disastrous. And they not only said that they're going to follow Joshua, but they encouraged him to be strong, to be courageous, just as the Lord encouraged Joshua to do. And in just three days, they're going to enter the promised land. And one of the big problems is entering the land were these strongholds, these cities. And one of them was Jericho, a fortified city. Walls surrounding the city, armies. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. We're going to pick up Joshua chapter 2, looking at verse 1. I've called this study a rescue mission, as you will see. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So Joshua sends two spies to go and spy out the city of Jericho to check out the city before they came to invade the city to take the city. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was Joshua... I don't know if I'd want to send spies to check out Jericho. And you know why? Because 40 years earlier, something bad happened when spies went into the land to check it out. Turn over to, to Numbers for a second. N Numbers 13. Moses sends out some spies to check out the land, the promised land. And this is 40 years earlier from this time here in Joshua. And they came back with, 12 spies went in, 10 spies came back with a bad report. And in, starting in verse 21 of Numbers chapter 13, this is what we're told. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ammon, uh, Sheshai, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and there cut down a branch with uh, one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshcol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So, so far so good, man. The land's bountiful. Plenty of food. The food is awesome. Great report. But there's always a but, right? And that's not a good thing. Look at verse 26 here in Numbers 13. So they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and, it, this is, and this is its fruit. I mean, look at this stuff. It's great. And then, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, come from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so, were, were, and so we were in their sight. Notice, things looked great. Nevertheless, in spite of everything looking great, <coughs> Nevertheless, why? They looked at the situation with their own eyes. They were overwhelmed, and they told the people, man, as great as the land is, we can't get in it. 
we're not going to be able to take it. Their people are stronger than we are. Their cities are fortified. Man, there's giants in the land. Did you see those guys? That's 10 of the 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb, the other two, saw things differently. Hey, let's go in and take the land. God promised it to us. God's going to give us the victory. It doesn't matter how big, how many people are there. It doesn't matter that their cities are fortified. It doesn't matter even if there's giants there. God's given us this land, and we need just to go in and take it. But the problem was that these ten spies who spoke poorly about gaining this land discouraged an entire nation from entering it. Ten people discouraged the entire nation. Look at Numbers 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select the leader and return to Egypt. This is what discouragement does. The nation says, let's look for another leader. We don't like Moses. We don't want to go into this land. We're going to die. Let's find a leader to take us back into the world. Back to Egypt. What was in store for them in Egypt? Bondage. That's why it amazes me. Christians are being drawn back to the world. Do you realize the world had you in bondage? You're free in Christ? Why do you want to go back to it? And I'm not saying there's not things that are enti not enticing. They are. That's why people are drawn back. But remember where you came from. The world had nothing for you. God has everything for you. Don't go back. Don't take your eyes off the Lord. Don't look at the situation. Trust in the promises of God. That's really a key. And here in, in Numbers 14, we see the results for the generation that refused to go. Numbers 14, starting in verse 20, we're told this. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test... Now these ten times have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Jump down to verse 28. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have murmured against me shall fall in the wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your son shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely for forty years, and you shall know my rejection or my opposition. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all the, this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So we see that entire generation from 20 years old and above would die in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. They would not enter the promised land. Joshua and Caleb were walking by faith and not by sight. And think about it. All the miraculous signs they saw in Egypt, the plagues, right? And even on some of the plagues, how God differentiated between his people and the Egyptians. They're leaving Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians. Not with swords. The Egyptians just gave them all this stuff. And then they come to the Red Sea. 
And God parts the Red Sea. They walk through on dry ground. And God says, I'm giving you this promised land. It can't be done. It's impossible. How's, that, how's God going to do that? We're going to die. Isn't it easy? You know, God does something great in our lives. And then another difficult time comes and we start doubting. Well, don't you remember? Yeah, but look at this. No, stop doubting. Trust in his promises. I mean, think of, it, think of this. Maybe one and a half million people in this age group died in the wilderness. Only two out of that entire age group entered the promised land. Again, Joshua and Caleb. And the people who brought this bad report, those ten spies, now the men who Moses sent to spy out the land in Numbers 14, 36 through 38, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. Here we are now in Joshua, 40 years later, right? 40 years down the road. And Joshua sends two spies in the land. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, you know what? What are you doing, Joshua? Remember what happened with the other spies? I don't think we should do this. I know two is less than 12, and maybe you think it's better, but come on. First of all, did Moses just send the spies in the land 40 years earlier on his own accord? No, the Lord told him to. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses was following the Lord, and I believe Joshua was doing the same. I don't think Joshua just did this on his own. I believe he was following the Lord, and you'll see why. I believe these, that Joshua was following the Lord by sending these two men in in a few minutes here. And remember, the Lord said uh, to Joshua, you know, be strong, be a good courage. Observe all that I tell you, right? All that the ser my servant Moses did, don't turn from the right hand or the left hand. You're going to prosper wherever you go, but you've got to follow me. And I think just as Moses followed the Lord, Joshua did likewise. So he sends these spies, two spies into the promised land to spy out the city of Jericho. That was the first place they were going to do battle with. And it makes sense, you know. Of course you want to send spies in to check out the area you're going to, the enemy you're going to fight. You know, what kind of defenses do they have? How big are their walls? What's their army look like? You know, find this out. This is a, a, a reconnaissance mission, really, in a sense. But that's not what God did. And it seems strange, but if they weren't going to get a battle strategy to see what the enemy was like, what the city was like, what the walls were like, what were they doing there? Now, I'm going to answer that, believe me. But understand, when these guys come back, they don't come back with one battle plan. They don't say, hey, the walls are this thick, they're this tall, there's got soldiers on them, sometimes they've got a lot, sometimes they have a little. There is no battle plans, no strategies to defeat the enemy at all. So it doesn't make sense to me. Why would they send, why would Joshua send these guys in there? Well, I think God had another plan, another purpose. And it was a rescue mission. What was he going to do? He was going to destroy the city of Jericho, right? Judgment was coming upon them. Who did they go to rescue? Well, again, look at what we're told in Joshua 2.1. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So the, these guys are lodging at the house of a harlot named Rahab. And I think sometimes, you know, we read these Bible stories and we don't think much about it. Why the house of a harlot? I mean, these are men of God. What are they doing in a harlot's house, right? I mean, come on, there's got to be something else there, right? A Motel 6, don't they keep the light on? I don't know. No, there was no Motel 6. 
And this is what happened many times. On the walls of these cities, these homes that were there were places of prostitution as well as places to lodge. And understand, a lot of these travelers, as they traveled, prostitution was just part of it. That's what they were involved in. A lot of the gods they worshipped involved sexual relationships. So this was nothing special or different. And yes, in these homes of prostitution, they had places for people to lodge to stay there as well. That was Rahab's. Now, I realize that there are a lot of people who feel she wasn't a harlot. I've even read some articles in Archaeology Review that say that the Hebrew word can mean innkeeper or someone who cares for you. And as true as that is, what do the scriptures tell us? Well, here it says harlot. What about Hebrews 11.31 in the New Testament? By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Harlot there in the Greek is, or I mean, the Greek word for harlot there speaks of a uh, harlot. That's as simple as it could be. James 2.25. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? It's the same Greek word in James and in Hebrews. So they stayed at the house of Rahab the harlot. Why? Because they're fitting in with the rest of the people that are traveling. Where did, I mean, you know, you just don't go stay outside so people can, hey, what are those guys doing here? Why aren't they staying in one of the prostitutes' houses? No, they're just fitting in with everyone else. So they're not recognized as spies. I mean, Jericho was already on alert. They heard about the children of Israel. They heard about them crossing the Red Sea and defeating the enemies on the other side of the Jordan River already. Word had gotten back to them. And now these same people who did that are here. And they're worried that they're going to attack Jericho. So these guys, again, just want to blend in. Now, think about this woman, Rahab. Is there anything, anything in her life that would cause God to love her? Was she such an outstanding person that God said, man, I just got to love this person and save this person? No. She was a sinner. She was a prostitute. Nothing in her life that caused God to say, hey, this is a good one. We got to save her. That wasn't the case. A prostitute, a moral woman, living in an immoral land, worshipped the many gods of the Canaanites. And like I said, many of these gods were worshipped through sexual orgies. Nothing in her life showed she deserved salvation, that she deserved to be saved. You think, well, what did she need to be saved from? The coming judgment. The coming judgment. That's what she needed. I mean, judgment was coming upon Jericho. God was going to destroy the city completely, wiping them out. So she needs to be delivered from this coming judgment. Secondly, more than just physical deliverance, she needed to come to faith in the living God and grow in that faith. She, she had limited information, and I believe she's saved. But before the judgment came, she had to be rescued. So I don't think these two men were spies. I think they were witnesses. And specifically for a woman named Rahab and her family. And it's, this is an amazing, amazing story to me because it, it relates to our own lives. Is God preparing to judge this world? Think about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I look at the things that are happening in this world. Oh, you know, man, it's getting close. I look at what's going on in the Middle East. War could break out at any time. I look at what's happening with artificial intelligence and you go, wow, what point is... It going to be, wow, we've reached this point now. God's going to come back. You know, I don't think we're going to have Terminators, but I think we will have artificial intelligence. I think that is uh, the beast, um, the image of the beast, excuse me, and spoken of in Revelation, that the Antichrist gives power to. Because he knows who's all, uh, who has the mark and who will, and you cannot buy or sell without that mark, the mark of the beast. How can any human achieve that. They can't, but artificial intelligence? Absolutely. Max and I were just talking about that this morning, how advanced artificial intelligence is. 
Look at some of the, you know, your phones. You know, you, you Google something. I, I, I want to, you know, find a bone for my dog. And you're looking on. And all of a sudden, here comes all this stuff later on on your page about dog bones. All kinds of bones. How do they know that? Because they're using AI to get to you. So how far are we before judgment comes? I think we're close. Well, what if it's not for another 100 years? Then I'm with the Lord, man, because I'm not going to live another 100 years. So it's, but all I know is this. Paul was looking for the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, almost 2,000 years ago. And this I know, we are almost another 2,000 years closer to his return. And it could happen at any moment. And we should all have that joyful anticipation. It could happen at any moment. What a great thing. Peter said in 2 Peter 2.9, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. That day of judgment's coming. Jude, verses 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. What's interesting to me is that the Bible tells us that prior to the coming of the Lord for his bride, the church, it's going to be like, the days of Noah, where people are eating and drinking and getting married and life is just going on. They're not even aware of it. They don't even care about it. And it's, I guess they, it's not that they didn't know judgment was coming, they just didn't care. Because people were saying, talking about it. Think about for Noah, building the ark, maybe 120 years building the thing. Witnessing? What are you doing, Noah? Well, judgment's coming. This is an ark where God is going to preserve us so the floods come. Yeah, good luck with that, buddy. Right? Until the first raindrop fell. Well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about here in Joshua? It has everything. Because, guys, we're on a rescue mission, and our rescue mission is to bring the gospel message to the people of this world. We're to be a witness to this world of the love of God for sinful man and point people to the only one who can rescue them, the only one who could save them. That's Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Isn't that our mission as well? Now, some people, maybe just a little harsh here, but... They feel there are some people who don't deserve to be saved. And I don't want to shock anyone here, but there are none who are worthy or deserve to be saved. I hate to tell you, you're not such a great person that God saved you. You were a sinner, and God saved you. He saved me. That's the wonderful news. You know, we think that we're so special. No, we're sinners. God saved us because he loves us in spite of ourselves. Paul in Romans made it clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good, no, not one. And if you still don't get it, he says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there. We're all in trouble, just like Rahab. We're no different. We're no better than she was. We're sinners, and our sin has separated us from God. And Jesus is the answer. And the problem for those who have come to saving faith is that many don't like to get their hands dirty. They don't want to come in contact with sinners. And they have elevated themselves above others. We're all sinners. Why? Do, Jesus, Almighty God, came and touched our lives, huh? And we think we're so special that we can't touch others. That was the Pharisees of Jesus' day, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. You know, 
tuck my robe in. I don't want to touch any sinners with my robe because that would make me unclean. They were upset with Jesus. They rebuked him because he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Doesn't this man know that this woman here is a prostitute? How could he be with her? Right? The Son of Man has come to, say, to seek and to save that which was lost. Sinners. He came to save sinners. And to save them, don't you have to be in contact with them? You know, we have developed a society today with you know, all our technology that our contact with people is this. Have you ever reached out and just touched someone? Gave them a hug. It's really hard to hug someone with a phone, isn't it? Can't you see that? Come on, look, I'm hugging you. It's not the same thing, is it? But I'll tell you what, when your heart's broken and someone comes and gives you a big hug, wow. I'll tell you what, when yesterday my family did a wonderful thing for me. My birthday's not till Halloween, but they had a surprise party for me. Surprise, it's not really your birthday, but we're having a birthday party for you. And uh, I'll tell you what, the most wonderful thing was just going around and hugging each family member, reaching out and touching them. It was the greatest gift I had. My one brother I haven't seen for 14 years. The last time we were all together was 14 years ago. After my dad died, my mom took us all on a cruise. 14 years ago was the last time all of us were together, all four of us. It was the most wonderful thing. And my brothers are not really huggy people, but I kind of am. <laughs> so I don't really care. You're getting a hug. And they hugged me. And it was great. You have to reach out and touch people. Show that you care for them. Show them that you love them. I mean, you can't imagine how much God loves you. Loves people. I mean, think about this. The first character we're introduced to in this book, Moses is dead, but the first character is Joshua. Joshua is a type of Christ. The next person we're introduced to, Rahab, a Gentile sinner. Wow. That's pretty interesting. And what is God doing with this woman? Saving her from the wrath that's to come. The judgment that was coming upon this wicked city, Jericho. And what we see here in Joshua and into the New Testament is that love of God for a lost world. And his love is seen in what he's done. Never lose sight of that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. And everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they, may have, that they have been done in God. You see, here's God. His arms are open wide. Come. Come unto me. Receive me into your life. I've paid in full the penalty for your sins. God came to save sinful man. And all you have to do is repent and receive that free gift, asking him to be Lord and Savior of your life. It's his desire. Peter says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I hear people say, oh, God's not fair. He's, look at man, he's sending people to hell. No, he's long-suffering. He's patient, he's waiting. His desire is that all would come to saving faith, but he will never force anyone to saving faith. It's a choice you have to make on your own. It's your free will. But we also have to understand there is coming a day of judgment. And Peter said in 2 Peter that the day of the Lord's going to come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens are going to pass away with great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 
Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And I think this is looking towards the eternal state. God creates a new heavens and a new earth, a new Jerusalem that you read about in Revelation chapter 22, I believe it is. Wonderful day. But judgment's coming. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. The big question is, are you prepared to meet your maker? Because you need to be. And God desires that you come to saving faith. And think about it. You know, for us as Christians, how do we evaluate spiritual success? How many people go to your church? How big is your building? Do you have a television ministry? You know, do you have a radio ministry? How big is your budget? Do you have this? Do you have that? Spiritual success is people. It's never about buildings or things. It's always about people. God came to save people, right? And what I mean is this. Are we out, are we concerned for the lost? Are we out rescuing people from the coming judgment? As I'll tell you what, if you truly believe judgment is coming, you need to be out there. But let's say you don't believe that his judgment's coming. Do you really know for certain that the people you come in contact with will be alive tomorrow? That's the bigger issue. You don't. You know, I look at Carl. Carl today is uh, one of the Roman Catholic churches. They invited him to play some Christian music. And, you know, Carl is going to share, you know. We pray for boldness. I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if he needs more boldness. But, yeah, Lord, give him boldness. Will he ever be invited back there? Maybe not. But they invited him to share the gospel, not to share the gospel, to share his music ministry. And through that, he's sharing Christ. Because it's not about the music. The music is a vehicle to bring people to Jesus. And if you only had one opportunity, don't you want to use it? I look some of, at some of these you know, popular pastors who are on these talk shows and stuff, and they're afraid to talk about sin. They're t afraid to talk about Jesus being the only way. Why? Because I won't be on that show anymore. People won't like me. So you're letting the fear of man drive what you say instead of the fear of God lead you in what to say. Because if one person gets saved, does it matter if everyone else hates you? Absolutely not. Because one person coming to know the Lord, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. There's a hallelujah wave going on up there. Everyone's like, woo! Come on. Let's get our focus right. It doesn't matter how, many, how popular we are in this life. Because you know what? We die and everyone forgets us. You know, it doesn't matter. But the Lord never does. So who are we serving? Why are we so afraid? And think about do we have prejudices? Yes. Oh, I don't know if I could talk to that person over there. Look at the way they're dressed. I mean, I've never seen hair that color before. Those earrings. That guy has some nice earrings, but I don't think I'd wear them. And so we've got these prejudices, you know, that keep us away, make us uncomfortable, because they don't dress like us. He's probably saying the same thing about us, right? Look at how those people are dressed. Wow. A writer from the second century put it like this. As the first Joshua sent his spies before him and they were received into the harlot's house, so the second Joshua sent his forerunners whom the publicans and harlots gladly received. Who are we going to? We're going to sinners. And that's our Lord, our Yahshua, coming to save sinners. He came to save you and me. And he wants us to go out and bring that good news the gospel message to a lost and dying world. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus opens this up, these words that he spoke before he gave the Great Commission, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And the word for authority speaks of an official right or power. He has the official right. He has the official power to do these things because he's God. All authority that's out there has been given to Jesus. He wants us to understand that before he gives the next command. And it is. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's not a good idea, but it's a command. Think of it like this, an, an officer reminding a private of his rank before he gives the order. Absolutely. And that's what we see here. He has all the authority, and thus he can send whomever he wills to do whatever he pleases. And that's what he's telling us. Go. Because he has that authority. To make all nations, make disciples of them. And really... It, the word go should be better translated as you are going. I think, well, what is, what's the difference? What does that mean? As you're going to work, as you're going to school, as you're going to the store, as you're going to the neighbors, wherever you're going, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news with others. Let them see Jesus in you. We're to be going out, not staying in. And it's everyday living. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Make disciples of them. You know, as you share your faith and they come to saving faith, then you need to take them kind of under your wing and teach them the things of God. That's an important aspect. Baptizing them. Baptizing not for salvation. Because Jesus saved them. They're already saved. But now, baptism is an outward showing of what's taken place in your heart already. Letting people see that. It was a big thing back then. It's kind of, let me put it in terms of how we look at things today. A Muslim coming to saving faith in Jesus and being baptized. I renounce all, all the other gods I worship. And now I worship the true and living God. I am dead to the old life as I go down into the waters of baptism. I'm being brought up new, a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, you are identifying yourself to the world now that you're a Christian, that you're a Christ follower. That's why, you know, when we do baptisms, we love to go out into Lake Michigan. And... Get the worship team out there. They, we do some worship songs. We, I share a message. People are, are watching. They hear music. They come and see what's going on. And then we go out into the lake and we baptize people. Because it's a witness to the world of what's taking place in your life. And I think it's really important that that our love for God is so intense that he just flows from our lives and touches the lives of others. And one of my passions when I first came up here to Manitowoc was that a, a large portion of our uh, budget would go to missions. And we've been really pretty good, mostly like 18, 20 percent, sometimes I think it was 25 percent of our budget went into the mission field. You know, we support missionaries in India, in Jordan, China, Ukraine, Haiti. We send out CDs every week. We send our written notes to men who are in prison each week. We've been to Russia, Haiti, Mexico with the gospel. We have outreaches. And mostly, and to me this is probably the most important thing, one-on-one -on -one contact. We felt that the radio station was a witnessing tool on 24 hours a day, seven days a week with Bible teaching. We really felt that there were other Christian stations that did music. And so we wanted a primary focus on teaching. And I can't tell you how many um, people who don't come here listen to the station. They, they call me, they tell me, they write me letters. It's pretty incredible. 
we, Conrad had mentioned, hey, why don't we put speakers out here? Well, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I don't know. And then I thought, well, the gas station has them. Yeah, let's do it. Put speakers, put a bench out there. People walk by, they hear the station. They can sit down, relax, listen to the station. You never know. Our web page, we have all our audio um, files. We have our written notes. We have video files on the entire Bible. All free for people to use. We're always looking for ways we can minister to people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, it's amazing how even unbelievers are listening. I don't get it, but they do. Well, praise God, because God's word doesn't return void. It accomplishes in our hearts what we sent it to do. And so as you share the word of God, and I realize, you know, I don't know, maybe you felt this way, you know, sharing the word, and you just think, oh, man, I wish I, I, wish I would have remembered this because I wanted to tell him this, and I did it. I'll tell you what. God's word doesn't return void. It will accomplish in the person's heart what he sent it to do, even if you screwed it up. It's a pretty amazing. You know, I shared with you before, you know, Pastor Raul Reese, I mean, sometimes his messages, he really screws up the whole study. I have no idea sometimes what he was even talking about. You know, 50 people get saved. Well, how, you screwed it up. How did that happen? Because it's not... Raul, it's the Lord. God's word won't return void even when we mess it up. That's the wonderful thing. Look for people you can minister to. Talk with. Just start talking with them. I mean, you don't have to you know, go up to them and say, turn or burn. That's probably not a good thing. But hey, you you look down. Are you okay? Is some, it's, I, do, are you okay? Is something wrong? You know, just be show that you care for them. I look at Jesus, and didn't he have compassion for people? That's what we need to do. Just show you care for them. It's amazing how people open up to you. I shared with you before. A few years back, I was having some blood work drawn, and I didn't know this person from Adam, and. Man, she just gave me her whole life story right there. It was incredible. And I, all I did was I showed that I cared. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. This opens doors. So remember that these men who were sent in to see Jericho were not on a reconnaissance mission looking for military secrets, how they could attack Jericho. How do I know that for sure? Well, in Joshua 2.24, when the spies came back, they said to Joshua this, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. No battle plans. The Lord has delivered all the land into our hands. The people are fearful. I see the hand of God working. And doesn't God do that with us? A little bit of encouragement. Oh, Lord, thank you. That just fired me up, man. I'll tell you, when you know, we did the Wendigo Fest a few weeks back, it was just that first person talking to that first person. All of a sudden, man, you said, okay, here we go. It was great being able to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. And I think, boy, encouragement is so important. Remember, ten spies discouraged the entire nation with a bad report. So let's encourage each other. These, God sent these men in. They walked by faith, and they brought the salvation to, of God to this woman. I believe she was already saved at this point, and we'll talk about that over the next few weeks as we look at the faith of Rahab. Because it's pretty amazing. She knew of the God of Israel. She had turned from the gods that her people were worshiping. She actually turned from her people because of her faith in the true and living God. Limited information she had. But this is an amazing woman. And you think, well, why did they you know, waste their time on this woman? I mean, who is she? Rahab the harlot. I mean, come on. Why rescue her? Rahab was the great, 
great-great-grandmother of King David. Wow. Didn't see that coming. We don't see anything coming, guys. Let's face it. God does. He knows what he's doing. Rahab and Solomon had a son named Boaz. Remember Boaz? In the book of Ruth? Mary's Ruth. They have a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse, of course, had a son named David, the future king of Israel. You see, Joshua sent these men in as spies. God really sent them in as witnesses. And often, guys, we have ideas why we're doing this or doing that, but God has a better plan. And it's usually after the fact that we see what God was doing was far better than what we thought was going to happen or what we were going to do. And Satan has brought so much confusion about Jesus today. And we have the truth, the Word of God. Let's share with people our living God, Jesus Christ. Because the truth will set them free from all the lies. You don't have to try and get people out of the denomination or whatever group they're with. You need to bring them to Jesus. Because I'll tell you what, there are some groups that will fight to the death for the denomination that they're in. They will live and die by it. But you share Jesus with them. God takes care of the rest. You bring them to the true and living God. You let them see that. You plant those seeds because it's that important. And we're going to look at, actually next week, the faith of Rahab. And it was a little faith. But what is interesting is she puts this faith into practice. I, I, I'm reading this, I'm going, wow, Lord, you've given me so much. And this woman had so little, and yet she's walking by faith. Help me, Lord, to be more bold, to take those steps of faith. And we'll look at that next time. Let me share this with you. There was uh, this gentleman who heard of a man at, at sea who was really seasick. Boat was rocking a lot. He was seasick, and he couldn't do any work for the Lord. He, he was just down and uh, and. While he was sick, he heard a man had fallen overboard. And he was wondering if he could do anything to help this man out, to save him. And he had a hold of this little light, and he held it up, held it up on the porthole. And the drowning man was saved. And when this man got over his attack of seasickness, he was up on deck one day, and he was talking to the man who was rescued. And the saved man gave this testimony. He said he had gone down the second time and he was just going down again for the last time when he put out his hand. Just then he said, someone held a light at the porthole and the light fell on his hand and a man caught him by the hand and pulled him into the light bulb. Kind of a small thing to hold up a little light, huh? What good can it do? And yet it saved a man's life. What about us? You've seen someone who's poor that's involved in alcohol or drugs drowning in the bondage of sin that they're in. Can you hold up a light of Christ and let them see it? We need to take the light of Christ into homes and businesses and into this world because there's a world of hurting people out there and God has called us to go to them and share our faith. Remember I said uh, that we are the light of the world, Jesus said. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When people look at you, when they look at me, what do they see? Many, many years ago, these guys were panning for gold in Montana. And they found this unusual stone, and, and they broke it open, and it was pure gold. They couldn't believe it. There it was. And they worked eagerly, and they 
discovered an abundance of this precious metal, of this gold. And they were shouting with delight. They were just so excited. We found it. We found it. We're rich. And they had to stop for a minute. They had to go into town and stock up on supplies. And before they left camp, the men agreed not to tell a soul about their find. As soon as they told someone, everyone would be there, right? So they didn't breathe a word about what they found to anyone. They just went into town, get their supplies, get out. And when they were getting ready to return, hundreds of men were prepared to follow them. And they said, who squealed? Who told you what we found? And they said, no one had to. Your faces showed it. What about us? Do our faces show our love for God? That joy of the Lord. What do they see when they look at our faces? Do they see Jesus? You know, Lord, less of me, more of you, right? And think about it. If there's no joy of the Lord, if it's complaining about this and complaining about that, who wants that? There's enough of that in the world. The judgment of God is coming, and we don't know how long before it falls upon the people of this world. Our mission, guys, is to rescue them from the lies of the devil and bring them to saving faith by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful story. And Lord, it from a human perspective, it doesn't make sense. We need to figure out how to defeat the enemy. Yeah, but Lord, you already said the enemy is going to be defeated. All the children of Israel had to do was walk by faith, to trust in you. And so this was a rescue mission for Rahab and her family, that they needed to be spared from the coming judgment. The city of Jericho was going to be destroyed except for this family. And Lord, look at how you used them. Lord, give us a passion for the lost that, Lord, we, our eyes would look at people with a backdrop of, human, of eternity in mind. And, Lord, encourage us to take those steps of faith. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.